Thank you so much. Good morning and welcome to the virtual Energy, Climate Change, Environmental Justice and River Committee. This is our regular hearing. Joined by my colleagues, Mr. Paul Kretz and Mr. Gil Cedillo. Uh, and we're expected to have others join as well. But we do have quorum. And before I turn it over to our clerk to call the roll, I'd like to remind everyone to make sure they're on mute when not speaking. Having said that, Mr. Villanueva, please call the roll. Council Member Mitchell Farrell. Present. Council Member Paul Coretz. Present. Council Member Gil Cedillo. Present. Council Member Kevin DeLeon. Council Member Paul Krikorian. You have a quorum, sir. Thank you, Mr. Villanueva. We will now hear from the public who wish to comment on items specific to today's agenda including one minute for a general public comment, if you are so inclined. Our city attorney will now explain the speaking rules to the members of the public who are calling in, and our city clerk will provide the necessary information for the public to dial in. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To members of the public calling in, when it is your turn to speak, please state which of the agenda items you'd like to speak on. You have one minute per item to speak, up to two minutes total, and one minute for general public comment. We will tell you when your time is up. When speaking on the agenda items, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you are not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell whether you are speaking on a specific agenda item, you will get one brief warning from me or the chair. If you do not immediately get clearly on topic or again straight off topic, the chair will cut you off and you will forfeit the rest of your speaking time, and we will move on to the next speaker. Please press star nine to request to speak. As soon as you hear someone address you on the phone, please press star six and state your name and state which agenda items you'd like to speak on. We know the situation is not ideal, and thank you for your cooperation as we do the best we can. Thank you. Thank you, Madam City Attorney. And Mr. Villanueva, uh, do you have further instructions? Yes, yes, sir. Um, members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1-669-254-5252. Again, the number is 669-254-5252. And use meeting ID number 160-919. 4459. Again, the meeting ID number is 160-919-4459, and then press pound. Press pound again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star 9 uh, to request to speak. When it's your turn to speak, an automated Zoom voice will ask you to press star 6 to unmute. Thank you uh, so much. And with that, we are ready to get started on public comment. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Hello, my name is Estella Suarez Hamilton. I'd like to speak on item seven, item eight, then after general public comment, please. All right, two minutes for the items and one minute for general public comment. Thank you very much. So for item seven, the Bureau of Sanitation report relative to developing voluntary service-based protocols. I went into the file and I looked at the uh, committee report, file 210031. Here in the fourth section, there's uh, it says the livability service division to continue to provide enhanced hygiene services. Include, but not limited to. So that means that we could, we have growing room, which I appreciate, but what I don't like here is four, five, COVID testing and COVID-19 vaccination when available. I don't understand why just medical services just couldn't be there. You know, it's so specific. And that brings me to items eight, because you have the testing and vaccination when available. Item eight is talking about the reduction of single-use plastics. Now, if you're going to be going around testing every homeless person whenever you, you know, whenever it's available, that's a lot of single-use plastic being used. If you had just 
medical services generally in a set place where homeless people could go. Maybe that could reduce the single-use plastics because then people could use other methods than just the little disposable tests that would most likely be used. That's just my logic there for that. I don't know how you feel about that, but that's my piece. For my general public comment, I know this is a different committee, but I wanted to thank this committee for having the live stream recording, having public comment um, available. I don't appreciate Paul Coretz yesterday muting me and not allowing me to speak. That is very disrespectful, and it's altering public records, which is a crime. So I know this is a different committee, but call, Paul Coretz, you're right there. I don't know if you're present. So please continue recording the live streams properly. You know what I'm going to say. We the people demand a redress of the vaccine-proof ordinance. Unconstitutional. Thank you for my time. Have a great day. Mr. Chair, if I could uh, insert myself for one second, I just wanted to say that while uh, this individual asserted such at the last meeting, I actually had no idea what he was talking about. And so uh, uh, don't believe that we've done anything of the kind he did testify. Thank you, Mr. Koretz. Uh, we are ready for the next caller. Paula, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Government relations. Oh, hello. Please state hello. your name and what items you would like to speak on. Yes, I'm James Toner, Director of Government Relations for the International Bottled Water Association, wishing to speak on agenda number eight regarding the Bureau of Sanitation report addressing single-use plastics. Uh, we are right. concerned with several of the recommendations and have submitted written comments to go into more detail. But in this brief time, I'd like to provide the committee with some information about access to bottled water and single-serve plastic water bottles. Uh, you know, efforts, we feel that efforts to restrict access to bottled water in any form hinder the individuals searching for a healthier beverage alternative. And bottled water has the lowest environmental footprint of any packaged beverage. Strictly regulated by the U.S. Uh, FDA as a food product, and uh, that makes bottled water a safe choice for consumers. And these recommendations will put citizens at extreme risk should there be a failure of public water system. Uh, all single-use PET plastic water bottles can, are 100% recyclable. Um, they are the most frequently recycled PET beverage containers in curbside recycling programs. And they only make up 3.3% uh, of all drink packaging and landfills. And importantly, in a recent survey done by the Harris Poll, it stated uh, uh, bottled water drinkers stated that they... 79% thank, of that. Thank you, caller. We, we have to limit one minute per item, but, but thank you. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Hi there, can you hear me all right? Yes. Awesome. Um, good morning, honorable council members. I'd like to speak today on item eight and general public comment. We have one minute for uh, my name is begin. Great, thank you. Uh, my name is Emily Parker. I'm a staff scientist with Heal the Bay. We're an environmental nonprofit based in Santa Monica, and I'm also the co chair of the Reusable LA Coalition, a group of organizations throughout greater Los Angeles that has been fighting for many years to end plastic pollution. Heal the Bay and Reusable LA strongly support the recommended policies relayed in the LA Sanitation Report that focus on transitioning from single use to reuse and refill. These policies are far and away the most effective and equitable policies to reduce plastic pollution that burdens not only our environment, but our frontline communities. Expanding the bag ban and banning po problematic materials like polystyrene and requiring reuse for dine-in are all just some examples of how we can both relieve the burden of pollution on low-income communities and communities of color and help to support our local businesses as they recover from the pandemic. There are some other reusable LA members here today that will speak on how some of these policies can be most effectively enacted. I'd like to speak today in regards to policy suggestions two and three. The LA bag ban has proven to be an enormously effective policy. According to Heal the Bay's beach cleanup data, since the LA bag ban was put into effect, the number of plastic bags collected on LA County beaches has declined significantly. Any arguments claiming that reusable bags are dangerous are just plain false. As a scientist, I've reviewed these claims, and time and time again, they are refuted. Additionally, science shows that banning polystyrene is both effective at reducing this extremely harmful, toxic, non-recyclable, and often littered material, and does not adversely impact local businesses. 
Currently, there are over 120 cities throughout California that have banned polystyrene and hundreds of others across the nation. Those cities have shown through alternative material cost analysis that polystyrene alternatives are available, economical, and budget-friendly. A study conducted in Tacoma, for example, found that an average cost increase for alternative materials is only four cents per item, and there are some fiber-based alternatives that are even cheaper than their polystyrene counterparts. Let us not forget the ultimate goal of these recommended policies, to protect our community. Los Angeles is a microcosm for the global plastic cycle, and that cycle pollutes at every stop. From Thank oil and gas drilling to... Thank, thank you, caller. Uh, and we've been joined uh, by Mr. Kevin DeLeon as well. Uh, next caller, please. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. My name... My name is Jessica Johnson. I'd like to speak on item eight and general public comment. All right, you have one minute for each. Please begin. Hi, I'm the marketing director at Our Cup. We're the leading reusable cup system serving a live event industry and also a proud member of Reusable LA. Thank you for supporting reuse through your policy work. The city of LA is in a great position to become a model city for reuse. Since 2017, we've been delivering our reuse system to eliminate the more than 4 billion single-use cups that are used at events every year. We also offer our wear, a reusable to-go foodware solution. We're excited about our work in L.A. and have activated at many landmark venues, including Hollywood Bowl, Rose Bowl, and Forum. We're positioned for growth in 2022, which will translate into economic development and green jobs creation for community. Our cup is proof that reuse is feasible, effective, and local businesses are on board. I'd like to offer up our expertise to continue building the infrastructure needed to bring reuse to scale in Los Angeles. Please reach out to Jessica at ourcups.com. Thank you for your time and continued support of reuse. Thank you. And we've been joined by Mr. Krikorian as well. Uh, next caller, please. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Make sure and press star nine to request to speak, caller. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Go ahead, state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Hi, this is Kathy Schaefer, San Fernando Valley Climate Reality Project, items number five and eight. All right, one minute for each. Please begin. Thank you. Uh, we know that short-lived climate pollutants remain in the atmosphere for a shorter period of time than CO2, but can cause greater negative impact with regard to warming of the atmosphere. Methane from landfills is a particular concern in large urban areas where tremendous amounts of food waste and other organics are generated and not diverted away from landfills. Many municipalities throughout California have developed and implemented programs for organic waste disposal. But due to COVID and other issues, Los Angeles seems to be running out of time to achieve the goals and timelines outlined in SB 1383. The San Fernando Valley Climate Reality Project supports this motion for a report on the necessary steps to achieve SB 1383 requirements and to encourage rapid implementation of a plan. There is no time to spare. And for item number eight, I would like to commend LA Sanitation for their comprehensive and detailed report on the reduction of single-use plastics. There are many excellent ideas for new ordinances and policies. However, in a city where most people don't even know how to recycle correctly, it will take a massive public outreach to ensure that public businesses and government entities reduce usage and correctly dispose of single-use plastic. The good news is that people want to do the right thing in reducing plastic waste, but they just don't always know how. So please make sure that public education is properly funded and staffed. Additionally, the most important sentence that I read in the report is, quote, rather than waiting to learn if proposed state plastics legislation will succeed or whether the November 2022 ballot measure addressing plastics pollution will pass, 
Los Angeles should assume a plastics pollution leadership position now. Thank you so much. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Uh, yeah, public comment, please. Okay, one minute. Uh, please begin. Yeah, I just wanted to make you aware of um, a lot of these uh, developers are um, cutting down a lot of the residential trees for their development. And these are mature trees, and those are those are the ones we need to breed. Um, and they try to replace them with these small little dinky trees that aren't going to do anything for anybody. Also, we're having a lot of uh, huge... Um, commercial vehicles, 18-wheelers uh, coming through residential areas, close to freeways, um, uh, close to schools, um, which is also creating a, a health hazard for the kids and everybody who lives around there. Um, and uh, that should do it for me. Thank you. Good points. Thank you. Next caller, please. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Good morning, Adam Wrigley on behalf of the California Chamber of Commerce. Wanted to speak on item number eight. Uh, one minute, please begin. Thank you. We wanted to register our opposition to these proposal. Uh, a vote at this time should be delayed given its magnitude and the fact the proposal was just released around a major federal holiday. It's precluded a number of stakeholders that will be directly impacted from having sufficient time to analyze the proposal in its entirety. The proposal will have substantial impacts to businesses, constituents, and the California economy as a whole at a time when businesses across the state are struggling to continue to meet demands. Supply uh, chains continue to remain constrained, and this proposal will exacerbate uh, increased costs of living uh, throughout the state. Um, it is difficult for manufacturers to produce a a, a city-specific uh, packaging type, and so that is why an L.A. ordinance can affect the entire state. And some of the elements of this proposal attempt to circumvent existing state environmental laws or are otherwise in conflict. For those reasons and others, uh, we remain opposed. Thank you. Thank you. Caller? Please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Hi, good morning. I want to speak on agenda item eight. All right, you have one minute. Please begin. Thank you. My name is Rick Rebus. Today, on behalf of the American Beverage Association, as many of you know, our member companies play an important role in the city's economy. Collectively, our companies provide over 2,600 jobs and with a direct economic impact in the city that totals over $2.3 billion. Over the last several months, we've been in communication with city staff regarding the report you're considering today. As we have communicated to staff, we are concerned about the proposals outlined in the report, which have made, been made available to the public last week. The proposals appear to undermine the sharp focus we all share about the need for recycling, which is the core building block needed to support a circular economy. We maintain a deep commitment to recycling and to reducing plastic waste in the environment, which is why beverage companies are investing in recycling modernization in California and are supporting measures to shore up the state's deposit system. We look forward to continued engagement with each of you on these issues and stand ready to work with you to ensure a sustainable future for LA. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Hello, my name is Miriam Gordon. I'm with Upstream Solutions. I'd like to speak on item eight. All right, you have uh, one minute. Please begin. Yes, I'd like to strongly support uh, policy number five for reuse for on-site dining. This is a triple win proposed policy. According to the program Rethink Disposable, Food businesses save, on average, between $3,000 and $22,000 by making each year by making simple changes to go from disposable to reusable packaging. 
This reduces the waste that the that local government needs to manage uh, through recycling or any other form of disposal. And it's a win for the environment because reusables are better than disposables by every environmental measure, whether it's climate, water, extraction. And consumers also, the third one is that consumers enjoy their meals more. So this will not only reduce plastic pollution, but all single-use products and their climate envir- and environmental impacts. Thank you. We encourage, thank you. Thank you. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Hello, my name is Nick Bureau. I'd like to speak on item number eight on behalf of the California Grocers Association. All right, you have one minute. Please begin. Uh, On behalf of the California Grocers Association, we appreciate the city's efforts to increase sustainability. We look forward to conversations. But it's critical that impacted industries like ours be fully involved in the formation and consideration of any policy. There are critical operational concerns connected to several of these proposals, including impacts to food safety and adulteration of products. We ask for your commitment that the grocery industry will be included as a full partner should you choose to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Good morning, Chair O'Farrell, Council Members. My name is Natalie Friedberg, President of the Silver Lake Chamber of Commerce. I'd like to speak on item number eight. Good morning. Yes, uh, one minute. Please begin. As I read over this very welcome report, it struck me how long we've all been working on the issues. And while this committee and the Council have taken some very meaningful actions, we're still seeing single-use disposable items accepted as a way of life. Some of you may be familiar with the Iroquois seventh generation principle which suggests that we consider how our actions will impact those who follow and that our decisions should be sustainable seven generations into the future. I'd suggest even more short-term thinking is needed to keep even just my nieces and nephews from being overwhelmed by the amount of waste we're currently producing. I think we should do as much as we can where we can as quickly as we can. There are areas where we're going to have a very tough time reducing our consumption of single-use items, such as in the medical world. There's just not a lot of wiggle room there. How we eat and drink when we're away from home isn't nearly as challenging. We have options. We can reduce how much waste we make, and we should. I strongly support the policies suggested in this report, and I hope that you adopt them post-haste. Other countries have been able to do this. We should be a leader in ours. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And I love the reference to the seventh generation Iroquoian uh, metaphor. Thank you. Caller, please state your name and what item you would like to speak on. Good morning, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is David Juarez, and I'm with the California Restaurant Association. I am calling on item eight and general public comment. All right, you have one minute for each item. Please begin. On policy two under item eight, the ban of polystyrene products, we ask that the committee considers the current shortage of alternative packaging. It is a big issue in the restaurant community, even in restaurants and cities where polystyrene has been banned for a while. These restaurants are having a difficult time finding alternative packaging, and if they do find them, they are doing so at a premium cost. So we are predicting we are predicting that it will take the restaurant community about two years to recover from the COVID-19 closures, and that's if there isn't another one. So we are asking the community to allow for an annual hardship waiver for restaurants and other food establishments. This way they will be granted permission to use these items if alternative packaging is unavailable or unaffordable. On policy three, the ban of single-use plastic bags and cups, we ask that the committee includes the County Department of Public Health in its conversations. The Russian community is extremely concerned that by banning these items, it will encourage people to bring their own, which sounds good, but we are regulated by the California Retail Food Code and are held at a high cleanliness and sanitization standards. So uh, we are concerned that we are concerned about cross-contamination and Foodborne illnesses that can occur when a bag or a cup that is not normally used for food or drink is used. This can lead to public health shutting down a restaurant. On policy five, requiring reusable foodware for on site dining, it's extremely troubling for us. About 90% of restaurants are tenants, they do not own the property where they are located at. This policy will require many to retrofit their restaurants to add a dishwasher, additional storage space, and counter space. 
these things are impossible for many restaurants to do without the permission of the landlord. And not to mention, this is thousands of dollars that a restaurant owner will have to incur. So for these reasons, we ask that the committee does a further study on this before considering this policy. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Are we hitting star nine to request to speak? Make sure that all callers, if uh, if you do that, I will hear you. Mr. Chair, there are no more speakers in the queue. All right, thank you. Uh, and thank you all participants in today's public comment. We appreciate your participation very much. Uh, and um, with that, what I'd like to do, colleagues, is uh, I'd like to continue item one. Uh, and if that is without objection, that shall be the order. And seeing as there is no objection, we'll uh, continue item one. And then also, colleagues, unless there is an objection, I'd like to move items two, three, four, five, nine, and 10 on consent. Second. Okay, sounds good. Mr. Kretz has a, a comment. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I don't want to pull item five. I'd just like to ask that uh, uh, we ask staff to come back quickly with a report. As was noted, uh, we are, are uh, a bit behind in terms of our SB 1383 compliance and all the importance of, of this issue. So uh, we, we would like them to come back quickly with a report and hopefully a report about how we can rapid, rapidly implement this program. So let's do this. Let's move uh, items two, three, four, nine, and 10 on consent. And, uh, and five. And five. Not, oh, you want to move five on consent? I'm pulling it. I just wanted to, okay. to make that comment. All right. But do we need to read the item and then officially uh, request that report back? I, I believe that might be the best thing to do. And then we can just then we can just uh, make that instruction and then and then vote on it. Let's just do it that way. Uh, so we daylight. So we daylight the item and then vote on it. So let's move two, three, four, nine, and ten on consent. I, I see no objections. Mr. Villanueva, should we vote on that? Yes, sir. I'll call the roll right now. Councilmember Mitchell Farrell? Aye. Councilmember Paul Coretz? Aye. Councilmember Hill Cedillo? Councilmember Kevin De Leon? Cedillo, aye. Okay, thank you, sir. Councilmember Kevin De Leon? Aye. Council Member Paul Krikorian? Aye. The items are approved, sir. Thank you. And let's, let's read item five. Item number five is a motion O'Farrell Koretz Krikorian relative to the instructions for the Bureau of Sanitation to report on the steps necessary to comply with the Cal Recycle regulations to reduce organic waste disposal by 75% by the year 2025 and the ability to develop a phased approach to compliant and related matters. So uh, let's uh, I'll instruct uh, a report back within 60 days since we're heading into the holidays. That's uh, more than reasonable. And then we can still move this item forward. Is that acceptable, Mr. Koretz? Yes, although I, if we could encourage them to come back more quickly than 60 days, that would be great. Yeah, we'll be in recess, but if we can get them scheduled in late January, uh, then we'll do that. Thank you. So let's uh, let's uh, that's the instruction, and let's uh, take a vote on that. 
Council Member Mitchell Farrell? Aye. Council Member Paul Coretz? Aye. Council Member Gil Cedillo? Aye. Council Member Kevin De Leon? Council Member Paul Krikorian? Aye. Aye. Uh, the item is approved, sir. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, I'd now like to move to item eight. And uh, Mr. Blaine Sutton Wills, if you please uh, read the item. Certainly, sir. Item number eight is a Bureau of Sanitation report relative to various motions on a reduction of single use plastics, including reusable alternatives, potential California Environmental Quality Act activities, and funding as well. Thank you, sir. Uh, colleagues, it is because of the work of this committee and our many partners in our collective efforts, the city of Los Angeles is taking some of the most progressive and critical actions to reverse course on the harm to our planet. I would also argue that in Los Angeles, a culture of environmental action is very well established. And in that sense, this initiative is another step in the long-term effort to reverse the profound damage to our environment with the understanding that our city has an outsized influence across the state and the rest of the country in this space. From LA 100 to phasing out oil drilling and now single plastics as one of the largest cities, if not only in the state, uh, we are sending a clear message that we'll not be reliant on fossil fuels and that we will continue to prioritize preservation and restoration of our shared environment. The report before us today is the direct result of our committee's April hearing, instructing uh, and re requesting a status update on all motions that seek to reduce the use of single-use plastics, leading us to eventually phase out single-use plastics entirely, as well as an update on the CEQA requirements and the funding necessary to support these efforts. This report, actions we will take today, bring us one step closer to making this a reality. Our focus will continue to be on reversing the normalization of massive single-use plastic consumption and waste. This is about changing Angelino's behavior and working toward creating the infrastructure necessary to build a circular system rather than a linear system where, quote, recyclable items that are not recyclable at all are just thrown away end up as trash on our streets or in landfills rather than returned uh, to the market. For example, in the U.S. alone, restaurants spend billions of dollars on plastic service wear items that just end up in our waste stream and will exist there for centuries, especially since there's no recovery facility service in all of L.A. County that recycles plastic food service wear, according to the UCL Plastic Center for Innovation. That said, we have LA Sanitation present to do their presentation on this very important report. And I see Barbara Romero is in the house. Uh, so Ms. Romero, if you could please uh, take it from here. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. Uh, good to be here. Um, I, just, I just wanted to just say, uh, introduce myself and to those of you who don't um, in the audience to say that I'm here um, to have with my staff to share a comprehensive approach to these issues. And, you know, it is very comprehensive. Uh, like I said, uh, the due diligence has been done. Now we're here to ask to get your guidance on what you think is feasible and what you'd like us to do moving forward. Um, as I've been telling staff, my son just did a plastics report. And in his plastics report, he talks about what would a future look like without plastic? And his conclusion was, you know, we have to actually, you know, we have to look at a compromise. We have to look at how, you know, everybody has to play a role in, in the plastic solutions. And that means that you can't, you know, he says in his report, it's not, it's not that you can't use plastic, just not more than you need. That is why plastic, you know, and plastic is bad, but it had, doesn't have to be. And that compromise and looking at a, a comprehensive approach is just like what you stated, council member, um, is an important approach. I, and um, I'm here with staff to, um, to allow you to hear from them 
uh, their, their comprehensive presentation, but they'll be brief. So I'll turn it over to Alex. And I know um, uh, I'm here also for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, good morning, Honorable Chairman O'Farrell and Honorable Council Members. Alex Lu for LA Sanitation. We do have a quick presentation that Dr. Romano will be sharing so we can go over the items. So Dr. Romano, can you please present? Right. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so over the last several years, the council members as um, mentioned by the chairman have introduced several motions focusing on reducing the environmental and climate impact of single use plastic items. This is a list of the items that we are addressing in today's report. Rowena, next please. So council instruction to Alisan were very direct. It instructed us to report back on the multiple motions dealing with plastic and single use products. And council also instructed Alisan to be aggressive and bold and develop long-term plastic reduction strategy that goes beyond the scope of the eight motions that we just presented. Next one, please. So the policy recommendation that we are presenting today has been grouped into seven broad recommendations. And again, when we're dealing with eight different motions, we're trying to coalesce that information. All the recommended policies you'll be hearing today are aimed to reduce the entry of plastic waste into the environment reduce waste generation, eliminate single-use products, and encourage sustainable green procurement. I also like to point out that some of the recommended policies that we are mentioning today will fall under local jurisdiction, while other policies are preempted by state law. And we would need the council support to change those at the state level. Next one, please. So the first one really is the city leading by example. And I wanna turn it over to Jennifer Pinkerton where we basically began looking at what we could do first as a city and set up the example for others to follow us. Jennifer? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good morning. Thank you for your time. Um, just to reiterate a few points that Alex just made. When I wrote this report, I basically put everything on the table. I looked at plastics, but also single use disposables. I framed the report through the prism of zero waste because the fact is we cannot recycle our way to sustainability. We have to adopt more upstream measures that reduce or even prevent certain materials from entering our waste stream. So that was that was my framing device for this. Um, so obviously with this slide, very important for the city to exhibit leadership and walk the talk as is cited in the Green New Deal. Um, the city does not exercise the control that it really can. We have tenants. We have events held on our properties. We sponsor city events. So we can um, we can exert more control over all these events. So these are the specifics, no single use, no expanded polystyrene anymore, um, no single use plastics, ideally no single use products at all at catered events. Um, let's get away from the um, water sold in single use beverage bottles. And then another item, a little bit of an outlier, is we do have a lot of uniforms. Um, many of those are synthetic items that do shed microplastics. So we'd like to get away from that. I'm sorry, am I talking over someone? OK. All right. Uh, all right, thank you. Um, as was mentioned, many other California cities have already adopted bans on polystyrene. Some look just at food wares. Some, like San Francisco, is applied to a full array of products. So we are recommending that the city of Los Angeles look at all the products out there because polystyrene technically is recyclable, but it really has no markets. And the fact is that most of these materials arrive broken in so many pieces at MRFs that nothing can be done with them other than disposing of them. Next slide. Um, single use bags and cups. I know there's opposition to this, but the fact is single use plastic bags really were not prevalent in our society until the 1980s. We lived without them. We can live without them now. Um, mostly non-recyclable plastic. And there are options. Everything, when I'm suggesting a ban, there are alternatives out there. I'm cognizant of the fact that changes will require changes to policies, procedures for retailers, manufacturers. There may be some initial costs, but 
there are alternatives out there and we believe we can take steps to mitigate any increased costs. Uh, next slide. Bottled beverages, this is a very broad category. Um, we, although plastic beverage bottles are recycled, still many are not. Um, Plastic, water and plastic bottles, there are simply uh, other sources. We can increase the number of hydration stations, drinking fountains, a um, lot of options out there. And bottled water is extremely expensive when considered compared to the cost of tap water. Um, it's on a magnitude of 100 or even 1,000 times, depending on the cost for bottled water. So don't think it's necessary, and there are ways to work around that. There are other alternatives. The plastic and tea bag reference may seem a little much, bit of an outlier, but the fact is due to the organics diversion mandates of SB 1383, we are going to have to increase composting of items, especially food contaminated paper based items. Surprisingly, a lot of tea bags have plastic in them. People are not aware of the health implications and that presents problems for composting plans. Um, we would like to see a refill and reuse infrastructure reestablished in the city. We're a large enough city that we think this is feasible. Um, you can't simply maintain the linear system that we have in place. Um, yes, we know that um, manufacturers have made great strides as far as recycled content, some of their bottles, but we do think more can be done. Um, leashed lids, we think, is an imperative because bottle lids are a highly littered item. Yes, it adds a little more plastic to it, but the benefit outweighs the additional two grams per bottle on average. Next slide. Uh, food or accessories. Um, again, once upon a time when you went to a restaurant, you were never served on single-use disposable items. And I acknowledge the comment that most restaurants are tenants, but in our report, we address the fact that we have to look at building codes and other policies so that facilities that have restaurants start considering installing dishwashers, they need to allocate space for on-site food waste management, things of that sort. So it's about going back to a better type of infrastructure. Um, recycled content. If manufacturers want to continue manufacturing single-use disposable items, then we feel they have a responsibility to help recycling markets by including recycled content in their products. Um, the fee for single-use disposable cups, I know fees are always a little contentious, but the point of this is that consumers can readily purchase and carry with them reusable cups and straws. So really, we want to disincentivize the use of these products. Next slide. And at this point, I will turn this over to uh, Rome Rowena Romano, our division director. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, just expanding on plastic waste reduction, um, other policies we want to recommend is the promotion of reuse and recycling and banning the non-recyclable packaging that comes with many of the items that we consume. Um, for example, banning the meal kits unless manufacturers um, promote the take back or reuse of these non-recyclable components. I know the um, these meal kits have become popular over time. I myself have um, dabbled in it, um, but it does come with a lot of the little packaging for the little um, spices and whatnot, as well as those cold packs, as well as maybe styrofoam or EPS. Um, so we recommend that these types of packaging also require manufacturers to have take back programs for such non-recyclable components. Poly, um, policy number seven is the ban um, rec recommendation on banning disposal of textiles. So uh, many might not know or know that fibers are, you know, occur natural um, for clothing is natural as well as synthetic. And there is an increase in use of synthetic uh, materials for textiles and also an increase in the growing amount of um, textiles occurring in our landfills. So this recommendation would be to ban manufacturers and retailers from disposing of apparel and textiles. Many of these uh, materials that are returned or unsold um, as well as excess um, fabrics and scrap remnants um, that occur um, end up in the landfill. Um, and we are asking, uh, recommending me to put into place maybe stewardship um, programs as well as extended producer responsibility type of programs for these materials to reduce um, them or um, eliminating them from going into the landfill as well. 
other um, additional policies um, for consideration for this committee also includes the ban or sale of the use of bioplastic containing materials. Many bioplastics um, may seem to be recyclable or compostable, but we are finding that it really is not. Um, the MRFs cannot really distinguish between a regular plastic uh, material and these bioplastics, so it ends up being a contaminant in that, um, that market stream, as well as the compostability of these bioplastics still needs a lot of research um, and is very um, you know, dependent upon the type of composting, um, industri industrial composting that is occurring in the area. In addition, um, in addition to that, ban the manufacture, sale, and use of materials that contain per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, um, known as PFAS. At the state level, just this year, AB, um, 1200 signed into law the, um, the elimination of PFAS in the paper based food packaging, which um, you know, is used because of either is water resistance or grease resistance or oil resistance, but that PFAS does get into the food and then can you know, eventually end up in, in our bloodstream, um, causing um, other health, health effects there. Um, going into the textiles again, as um, was mentioned, a lot of our, our clothes are also um, synthetic as well as the natural fibers though a lot of the fibers um, become micro um, I'm sorry microplastics that end up in our oceans so microplastic filtration systems and washers are also being recommended as well as uh, possibly a fee on the washable synthetic items that can then be used to help um, mitigate you know um, microplastics from going into our oceans and on top of this just further improvement on local and regional utilizations of the recyclables um, including domestic content disclosure so that um, consumers know whether the product contains um, recyclable content can be recycled. Um, this goes into the labeling of the of the piece itself. And we know on the state level, they have also taken up um, the, the labeling aspect of it, making sure that only materials that are recyclable um, are labeled as recyclable, um, as well as using post-consumer content. So knowing that the material has um, was made of recyclable material, maybe that is something that consumers will, you know, take initiative on buying those kinds of products over others that contain virgin material. So at this point, I'll um, turn it over to Paul Cobian for the next slides. Good morning, council members. Um, so table two and table three found on page 10 of the report um, essentially provides the recommended approaches to achieving uh, these recommended policies, both in the short term and long term. Um, these approaches are dependent upon our ability to provide substantial evidence to support each CEQA recommendation. Uh, this will be achieved by working with the city attorney's office and ensuring that we comply not only with the CEQA guidelines and statutes, but that they are also implemented within the parameters um, of existing law. So table two here report uh, of the report identifies three options that we believe can be evaluated in the short term. Um, as uh, Jennifer already mentioned, this includes the city leading by example by directing city facilities and city sponsored events to be zero waste, um, EPS, and then also plastic bags. Next slide, please. Um, and table three identifies the, the broader categories that can be achieved by developing, a, possibly using, utilizing a program EIR. Uh, the advantage of a program EIR is that it allows for the public to participate in scoping meetings. Uh, we would also be required to do a full analysis of alternatives. And then we would also provide a significant amount of public comment period on the draft program EIR. Uh, when released. And so we've, we've heard some of the comments today from the public, um, a, a program EIR would, would probably be the best path forward uh, to achieve these, these broader uh, policies. The uh, next slide. And so really the, this last one here um, is uh, focusing on uh, table four of, of on page 11 re presents recommended policies uh, to be addressed at the state level that have a state and national level impact. Uh, you guys can see there on uh, or in the report, uh, these are mandate post-consumer content. These are some of the items that Rowena had mentioned in policy seven. Um, and so these are things that we believe can, can be addressed kind of more at the state level. With that, I'm gonna pass it over to Alex. So um, this brings us to the next steps. Uh, we have already spoke with the city attorney on the CEQA documents. But depending on the policies and the recommendation of this committee, we will have to go back and circle back with our CEQA city attorney and address what type of analysis is needed for uh, any of the policies. Um, 
we also in need of staffing. Um, unfortunately, we do not have the amount of staff needed to implement uh, many of these policies. Um, uh, these policies will make Los Angeles be the leader in the country and probably um, in the world if implemented a lot of these policy we are recommending today. We have some of these policies have implemented lo uh, in the local region. Some of it has done nationally, but a lot of it has been done overseas in Europe. Japan and other places that we looked into. So uh, we also would have a request from the city council and that is to direct the CAO to assist sanitation in identifying funding opportunities to help support affected organizations. We understand the impact of these policies are on sidewalk street vendors, on mom and pop restaurants and others who have to comply with this new policy. So we'll be asking for some funding that we can help transition this industry. And with this one, I thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Alex and Barbara and Jennifer and everyone who uh, reported on this. Really, really good stuff. Uh, any anything to add from sanitation? Okay. All right. Um, this report is comprehensive. It's involved. Uh, it's it's terrific. And uh, I do have some questions uh, before we, we turn it over uh, to, to everyone. Uh, the report mentions adopting an ordinance in the city of LA regarding the manufacturer sale and use of expanded polystyrene foam. I understand that a number of other cities have already adopted this ban. Has the department done outreach to businesses, especially small Usually, not always, but minority-owned businesses, especially the restaurants. I, I ask this in particular because a few years back when we were discussing the elimination of, of uh, cutlery, plastic cutlery, uh, I met with an organized group of minority-owned food service and restaurant businesses that, like so many, pre-pandemic, um, have razor thin profit margins. So, and this is a round table of about 20 or 30 small business and restaurant operators. Um, many of them monolingual Spanish speakers. Um, some of these businesses basically catered boxed meals to organizations or senior housing and service centers um, and depended on inexpensive packaging, overwhelmingly heavy on disposable plastics. Um, I think everyone here understands that eliminating all single-use plastics is the way of the future, and we want to get there as soon as we possibly can and, uh, you know, do what we need to do. But, but we must also take into consideration realities of costs and availability of biodegradable or sustainable green procurement, which is a great term, uh, in, in, the, in packaging, especially as we struggle to come out of this pandemic, understanding that family-owned mom-and-pop food service and restaurant industries were so hard hit by the pandemic. So question, because we're heading in this direction anyway, but we wanna make sure that we create a space for this you know, sustainable green procurement to reach every corner of the small business world for small business owners that depend on low cost packaging. So will adopting an ordinance require, I think the answer by looking at these tables is yes. The CEQA analysis uh, and, and how long will this take specifically for single use foodware plastic items? Alex, we can't hear you. Oh, Alex, you're on oh, mute. Sorry. Yeah, I can start and then Paul could really jump in. Um, Councilman Aferro, we, several cities around us, Santa Monica, Culver City and others, really and up and down the, the state have adopted ordinances on banning um, extended polystyrene. We in the city of Los Angeles, we've done multiple studies with, with the industry, with DART and other manufacturers. And we tried to accept it into our blue bin container. Unfortunately, the material by and large was not sustainable and could not be recycled. 
So we pivoted from the recyclability of the products to go into the banning phase of it. If the, uh, as mentioned by Paul, and I would have him elaborate more, if the council authorizes to proceed down this road, we do need to engage the mom and pop. Many restaurants we have checked in the city have already moved away from the extended polystyrene into more friendlier uh, alternative with a small price uh, difference. And we believe there is a need to help uh, alleviate the cost difference on the small mom and pop. But before we approach them, we really wanted to get the council approval on this one. If this is the intention to proceed, especially at a time when we've been hearing from restaurants that they are operating on very thin margin, a lot of their products is still leaving the, the restaurant for takeout. And the EPS has been helpful for them by reducing their cost, be able to manage this to keep the food hot. But I'll have Paul talk about the CEQA element of it. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, so as Alex was mentioning, um, you know, part of, uh, part of the process, there is an ingrained element of, of public participation, um, for instance, for the program EIR. Um, and so we would be required to uh, ho have a, a public scoping meeting um, to understand what are the needs of, of the community, of the businesses, um, and we would, uh, uh, you know, take the steps necessary to, to be able to integrate that into the overall program EIR. Um, so uh, it, it is something that we are aware of. Um, the, the, as we have there, I think in table three, uh, public outreach is one of the elements that, that we recognize that we would need to complete. I think that answers the question. So we're, we're looking, according to this table three, one to two years for the EIR. So if we adopted an ordinance right now to ban all single use plastics, um, it wouldn't be able to go into effect until after an EIR, EIR is complete. Is that accurate to say? That, that, that is, so, so actually we, we would need to fulfill the CEQA requirements before the ordinance is enacted. Okay, thank you, thank you, that, that, that helps. And it would give us some time to um, really create the process for that adequate outreach uh, to, to all, everyone knows it's coming. And uh, so it would give time for sustainable green procurement manufacturers to get, you know, lean he more heavily into the business uh, so that once we, we ban anything polystyrene, et cetera, as was presented in this report, um, we'd be in pretty good shape with uh, plenty of uh, advance notice. Uh, all right, thank you. Next question. Um, our 2013 council plastic bag ban has some exemptions as written. What are these specific exemptions and what would be the best way to amend the policy to lift these exemptions, understanding that the exemptions have uh, actually led to the continued disposable waste of of some of the plastics. So we know that eliminating the exemption may be necessary as a result. So um, what, what exactly are they? Some of the exemptions, I mean, uh, just stepping back a little bit. I mean, this, the, the city of Los Angeles was a leader in banning the plastic bags. And the state followed us after the city adopted the ordinance. And basically they copied a lot of the issues that we have uh, put in our ordinance about the thickness of the material. If we recall in the old days, they used to use these uh, flimsy trash bags, they call them t-shirts, because you could, you know, it comes out, rips very easily. The council approved a thicker 2.5 millis. So this way it'd be, so we can reduce it. We have seen reduction in the plastic. Unfortunately, is still being used, even with the thicker, to still have cause, it's not being recycled at the MRF because it's still jams. Even um, with all the changes that we have done, there's still uh, hardware stores were exempted. There were some exemptions to restaurants and also the WIC, women, infant and child, there were exemptions on that front. And so the state, after they followed us, they did put preemptions that we would need the state to really help um, 
But there's also certain areas the state did not touch on that we would need to work with our city attorney, Adina, and see how we can navigate through this one. I, I mean, I can tell you this um, city of Austin copied some of the stuff that we did in the city of Los Angeles, but they use even thicker bags, the four versus the, what we had. And again, you know, even with the thicker, they finding out you still cannot recycle the product. You still people using it um, one time and it's out. And I think council member Krakorian pointed out that multiple times to us is that we're still giving them, although they're a little bit thicker. And so we're trying to address it, but some stuff we might need the help of the state. Now, I'll, I'll just quickly add, um, you know, from a secret perspective, the, the project objective of the single use carry out bag ordinance uh, was to reduce litter in the city and associated adverse effects to stormwater quality and marine resources, as well as reduce adverse effects to solid waste landfills. Um, so for, for this plastic bag related items that we find in the comprehensive plastic report, we do see the 2013 uh, EIR as kind of the vehicle for either preparing an addendum uh, to expand uh, the EIR analysis uh, for, for these additional items. Thank you. Barbara, did you have anything to add to that? No, nope. okay. It's interesting, the city of Austin, Texas copied Los Angeles. I bet no city in Texas would ever admit that they're copying <laughs> city in the state of California. Uh, uh, when we crafted the policy on straws and utensils upon request, we included restaurants in the discussion, which, which led to a better policy. And by the way, it's not being followed in a lot of restaurants. And I, and I know that from when I go and I'm handed a plastic straw without question. So we need to, you know, be, we all need to play a role in making sure that restaurants understand the city policy. Has there been any outreach done to restaurants in relation to the plastic bag ban since they're currently included in the plastic bag exemption? I'm sorry, the, the question is? Oh yeah, has there been any outreach to restaurants in relation to the fact that they are exempted from the plastic bag ban? We have not spoken to the restaurants on the subject yet because we wanted to know if the council is willing and some of it, again, might be preempted by the state. We have to look into it. On what we have noticed though, is that prior to COVID-19, we had a lot of participation of restaurants and businesses with our ordinances. And what we are noticing with some restaurants is that because of the turnover of staff and you know the way things were going, they went back to their old ways of having giving out straws on the, you know, just handing them out and without really checking anymore. I can tell you when the ordinance was adopted, we did very thorough and we sent flyers, mailers, we had um, our staff, including myself, Jennifer, visit those who were, uh, where we get complaints from and address them. Um, the policy was focused only on complaint driven. So if we get a complaint from a resident, we would address it. And we kept the database of where the complaints were coming from. And we were able to address a lot of those complaints. Unfortunately, with the COVID-19, the pendulum shifted. We are trying to go back and get a handle on it, but we also asking in this report for four positions just to do the enforcement on this one and multiple others. In addition, we need to start gathering data, which is to tell the council if this policy is really working. So some, those are the four positions that we were asking for in this report. Yeah, what you just said, Alex, tracks anecdotally with what I've seen as well during the pandemic and now that knock wood, uh, it, it looks like it is lifting, notwithstanding Omicron. Um, all right, uh, thank you. And then uh, the report also recommends the possibility of a bottle beverage policy and recommends using leashed lids. So we've heard that leashed lids do use some additional plastic. So how do we deal with that? Is that true? What are the benefits for requiring leashed lids if that is the case? Yeah, we had multiple meetings on this one with the Beverage Association, and I would like Jennifer to elaborate on our discussions on this one about the weights and everything else that we looked into. Oh, certainly. Um, Council Member, we did have multiple meetings with representatives from different beverage industry groups, and the additional plastic for a leashed lid, the average weight that they cited to us was two grams. 
So yes, more plastic would go into the bottle, but we believe that the benefit of a leashed lid is that you will have fewer lids that are littered and making their way into the ocean. So there is a trade-off, but um, I think the benefits outweigh the additional plastic usage. Okay. And then, um, so are, are, there, are there similar efforts at the state level Cal Recycle to achieve the same single-use plastics reduction goals. How does this? How does that impact the policy recommend, recommendations in your report before us? And Alex, you kind of touched upon this. That it seems like after the city enacted its plastic bag ban, the state took action, which ended up limiting our ability to impose more restrictions on single-use plastics. Is so, um, you know. Do you have anything to add to that? Because you, you quasi already answered this question. Oh, you're on mute again. Oh, this thing. Uh, Jennifer could add about what's happening on the state level right now um, that we are tracking. But again, I think the council is, is ahead on this front. There is the November ballot that we've been hearing about. Jennifer, you want to add more on the state? Uh, sure. I am, Council Member, I'm not aware of any proposed legislation that dovetails with a lot of our proposals. Um, the main overlap was regarding the PFAS and food contact items. There was a state, um, Laura Friedman proposed legislation for the microfiltration systems in washing machines, but that did not pass. And as everyone knows, SB 54, AB 1080 has failed now for two years. So I am not aware of any any other measures overlapping with ours. Thank you. Um, and then clearly these potential policies, um, virtually all of them require CEQA analysis. Uh, does your sanitation believe uh, or, or city staff or uh, an on-call list of vendors that an on-call list of vendors could initiate the necessary environmental impact reports? Or will we need to procure that expertise through a consultant or consultants? Paul? What? Yes. So uh, Alisan does have uh, an on-call list um, that we have used, but it, it, there, there is a funding issue um, associated with, uh, you know, procuring the, the services. So as Alex has already mentioned, it's not only staffing, but it's also um, the funding sources specifically for those on-call services. Okay. Thank you. And it might have been Jennifer that mentioned this, the city walking the walk. And, and I'm a huge believer in that. So under table two, the first policy recommendation outlined is in regard to zero waste city facilities and city sponsored events. Since we have multiple departments that need to be part of this conversation, what will be the next steps to move this forward, including do we know if a CEQA analysis will be necessary for us to create an ordinance to, for the city to be compliant with what we are requiring of others? Um, I can jump in as far as working with other city departments. We're actually pursuing a policy in parallel with this, which is zero waste policy for the city. And we have drafted a zero waste events guideline document so that addresses most of these and we have identified all the city departments with whom we'll have to interact a lot of those sponsor very large um, events such as the lotus festival we have leases we have agreements for catered events so we have identified all the departments with with, with which we'll have to interact and i will defer to paul or alex as far as the sequin needed for that yeah that's a really good question so the, the sequel recommendations that we're presenting today reflect really our, our preliminary analysis of the various council motions before us um, i think when we begin the environmental analysis and review uh, the various environmental considerations we will have the responsibility as i think i already mentioned to to provide substantial and supporting evidence to support um, each sequel determination um, we i think we've we've mentioned the, in the report we, we do have not only the, the plastic bags eir Kind of on the books but we also have the 2014 solid waste integrated regional plan um, and and the focus of that one was uh, also zero waste and so uh, without necessarily doing the analysis we believe there are some pathways for CEQA um, uh, one way or another here right yeah i would love to move on that uh, and just broadcast that wide and far 
that the city has enacted this and it's following its own rule or its own law um, on on this zero waste at city facilities and city sponsored events. Uh, so thank you. Uh, with that, colleagues, I know Mr. Kretz had his hand up first and then followed by Mr. Krikorian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just have some comments. Uh, uh, first, I want to thank you for this hearing today and for your ongoing and strong leadership on so many important environmental issues. I also want to thank Mr. Krikorian for your partnership over many months working on this and the terrific members of both of your staffs. I want to thank the mayor and his team. I want to thank uh, Barbara Romero, LA Sands uh, general manager, and Alex Helu, the assistant director of the Solid Resources Group, who have overseen this effort. And I especially want to commend Jennifer Pinkerton and the rest of the sanitation staff who have worked so hard on this over many months. Jennifer, in particular, has turned out a world-class document that I believe will blaze a trail for many other municipalities and hopefully for the state to follow. This report is the culmination of so many years of frustration with the spread of plastics everywhere we look. As the city takes strong steps to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, we also have to keep a clear eye on the other avenues of pollution that the fossil fuel industry seems intent on destroying the habitability of our planet with. If they don't get us with climate pollution, they'll get us with plastic pollution. Today, I believe we'll start to turn the corner on that. So much of our pollution has to do with the daily bad habits that we may not even be aware of. But all this was really brought home when China suddenly instituted its national sword policy and stopped taking our waste which I thought was highly appropriate. We should deal with our own waste. And as we saw when we sent members of the sanitation staff to China, the reality was really our worst nightmare, that children sorting through trash, very little of it actually being recycled into something actually useful with a, a real market value, and most of it being burned or tossed into a nearby river where it washed into the ocean and became part of the uh, infamous islands of plastic that we're all aware about. And so uh, I, I, I want to see us uh, address this aggressively. Um, and uh, I, I look forward to that happening. Um, let's see. I, I know we need to remake the system. I know we need to go from a throwaway culture to a reusable culture. The old milkman model actually got it right. They sold you the milk and then they reused the containers. Coke isn't in business to sell us plastic bottles. We want what's inside. Now I understand we need to do some environmental impact reports on a lot of these issues in the LA Sand report to move them along. And I support doing that today. By the way, the question about locked lids, we can look for guidance to aluminum cans from the 70s when we used to pop the lid open and uh, little aluminum can lids were found everywhere in our litter. Um, we add a tiny fraction of aluminum to each can, um, but it's all recyclable and it, it eliminated the litter stream. Now, my main, main nemesis continues to be extended polystyrene, or EPS. According to the Californians Against Waste website, there are now 128 cities in California who have ordinances in place restricting EPS. Also, the entire state of New York has banned EPS containers and loose packaging materials. Because of other available cost-neutral containers, the banning of EPS has not caused restaurants or street vendors across 128 cities in California to suffer or go out of business. Now, from my view, anyone who continues to raise that as an issue this late in the game is drinking styrene straight out of a dark cup. Let's not waste any of our time today with ridiculous industry talking points that have no basis in reality. And speaking of no basis in reality, the LA Sand Report says it, the excellent UCLA Luskin 
Center of Plastic Waste in LA County report says it. The New York State report says it. There is no recycling market for expanded polystyrene. It's extremely difficult to transport and sort due to its weight. Its low density makes it difficult for facilities to recover a mass that is sufficient for recycling in an economically viable manner. And it's certainly not recycled anywhere near LA County. And most EPS is either landfilled or littered, neither of which is a good result. It's not actually factually recycled. Mayor Garcetti is set in his Green New Deal as one of his goals, uh, taking this step. And so let's give it to him as a farewell present and ban extended polystyrene once and for all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Koretz. Mr. Krikorian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you uh, for your questions and thank you, Mr. Kretz, for your uh, thorough comments and thanks. Uh, I think between the two of you, you've covered most of what I wanted to say uh, or ask. I have a few questions, but, um, but I do just want to make some contextual comments first. Um, this report is an exceptional work product of the Bureau. And, and I just want to thank all of you uh, deeply for this uh, thoughtful, thorough work. You really lived up to uh, the uh, full name of the Bureau, uh, the Bureau of Sanitation and Environment. And uh, I think you really demonstrated your commitment um, to thoughtful policy making with this report. And on that score, uh, I, I just think that this is one of the best examples I can think of of why uh, details about implementation matter, why stakeholder input in policymaking matters. And uh, too often uh, elected officials and activists and lobbyists uh, focus on slogans and you know, things that can be boiled down into a headline and it produces lousy policy. And what you've given us here is a real blueprint, an outline for making thoughtful, stakeholder-driven, sustainable, uh, economically viable policy. And that's what we should be in the business of, of doing. And, and I think that's why, uh, in so many ways, policies made here in Los Angeles become the models for uh, other cities and jurisdictions. Um, what we did with LA 100 is a perfect example of that kind of policy making. And we didn't just say we're going to get rid of uh, carbon fuels by such and such date. We figured out how to go about the business of doing it, accomplishing it, not just setting a goal. And that's really what you've given us uh, with regard to this incredibly difficult problem of plastics as well. Um, the the you know, it was in the 70s, Mr. Kretz uh, mentioned the aluminum cans, and I re remember collecting bottles to take back for the deposit. And, and you know, there's a lot of examples from, from back then of better environmental practices that we had. But in the 70s, for some reason, recycling became uh, of almost religious importance to the environmental community. And that was fine when we were talking about paper and aluminum and glass, but it has been a fallacy from the beginning with regard to plastics. And unfortunately, the truth is that the fossil fuel industry has crammed plastics down the world's throat in order to sustain their profit margins at a time when we're buying less and less of their product for transportation and, uh, and electricity generation. So, um, Plastics is the way that the fossil fuel industry is trying to stay afloat. And so now we're not doing the things that we used to with better, more sustainable products. We're substituting. We can't hear you. Oh, gosh. Have I been going this whole time muted? No, just a few no, seconds, Paul. Seconds. Just a few seconds. <laughs> okay, because okay, I was on a roll. Uh, All your beautiful remarks have been heard. 
<laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you, Paul. Well, I, was that, just, that, I, I don't know where I... <laughs> that was a message, Paul. That was yeah, a message. apparently, apparently. So um, I, I can't remember where I left off now, but but basically, <clears throat> the the point that I was trying to make was when this report talked about the myth of recycling, I almost wept because this is the first time I think. You know, I, I felt like a lonely voice in the wilderness sometimes talking about how recycling misleads the public when it comes to plastic. It's not an affirmative good. It's a it's a detriment to our environment when we talk about plastics recycling because it allows people to absolve themselves of their guilt about using single-use plastics. And sorry, I will not absolve you, uh, members of the public. Buy less. Don't use it in the first place. Don't think that you get off scot-free by tossing that single-use container into your blue bin because chances are what you're actually doing is contaminating the stream of things that actually are recycled. So um, the fact that, that sanitation stood up and said that just was heartwarming. And I think the public needs to really start to have a better understanding of this. All, anyway, sorry, that's a lot of background and you know, general stuff. Uh, let me just ask a couple of specific questions and then um, uh, give my applause to you one, one last time. First of all, um, the mayor has pre previously issued Executive Directive 25, which attempted to accomplish some of the things that we're talking about here in terms of leading by example, um, asking all of the departments and commissions and so on to submit plans uh, for uh, or to achieve their zero waste goals by 2025, uh, to submit annual status reports and, and so forth. So how, how are we in general, how are we doing in meeting that zero waste goal by 2025 that was uh, directed by the mayor? Uh, thank you, Councilman Krakonian. Um, the report the, the mayor ED25 directed all departments to, to submit the report by November 19. Our understanding, uh, some departments were able to meet the deadlines, others asked for a little bit of extension. So we haven't seen the rest of the departments. I know for us, what we have pointed out, we need to implement many of the policies that we are in this report and we reference it here. In addition, we need to do organics program to to help uh, take about 30% of the trash that's going to the landfill. Our goal as a city has been set about 90% diversion of material from landfill by 2025. And you're absolutely correct. And I think the chairman mentioned the same thing is that we cannot get ourselves out just by recycling this material. Um, like council member Koretz mentioned, we do need to do organics program soon. We need to implement so our uh, recommendation back to the mayor's office was many of the policies you see here, in addition, implementing aggressive organic program. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I can't speak on other city departments, I'm sorry. Not at this stage. Okay, well, maybe uh, at some point, Mr. Chairman, it would be useful to have a comprehensive report back from all departments, uh, a status hearing on how they're doing in terms of meeting that, that goal. Um, I, I hate to raise a, an uncomfortable topic, but, you know, I will. Um, the Recycla program was uh, disruptive of the entire waste management industry and uh, process in Los Angeles. And it's, you know, one of its principal stated objectives was uh, diversion from the landfill to achieve landfill diversion goals. There were other objectives as well, but that was the principal um, purpose of it. And given the change in the recycling market that Mr. Kretz mentioned uh, with the you know, change in Asian markets um, and given the new goals that we're uh, describing in, in this report, will it be necessary to revisit some of the uh, terms of the franchise agreements. Um, how do these interface, I guess, is what I would, would say. How, how have uh, the goals that 
we've set out here, um, how will they be able to be implemented given all the assumptions in the Recicla franchise agreements? So if I understand the question correctly, uh, I can tell you on the recycling front, we in LA Sanitation, we collect about 220,000 tons a year of recyclables. On the franchise side, the numbers we've been reaching about 180,000. So whatever we accept in the blue bin, they will accept in the blue bin that's provided to multifamily units. So the Recycla are required to match whatever we have on the, on the blue bin. So if we, as we outlaw the number seven polystyrene, number three, number four plastics, they will be following our suit. Right, and, and that's my point. So that changes the model that Recycla was based on. It, it changes the assumptions of what the waste stream and the blue bins for, for multifamily would be. It changes how they do their um, waste est their waste estimates. It changes the business model that uh, they have for recapturing um, sellable recyclables and, and so forth. I'm just I'm just wondering as we change the plastic stream in the blue bin, is that going to create a significant disruption of the of the business model uh, for the franchise agreements? It's, I believe it should not cost that much disruption for them. It actually will improve the quality of the recyclables. I can speak from our waste characterization studies where we have about 12% of plastics in our blue bin. And out of that one, as you pointed um, before, there's only about 6 7% who are recycled. The rest is basically landfill. And so I think you take about 10 to 12% of the 200,000 they collect if you take 5% out, that's 10,000 tons. So th that's really improved the quality of the recyclables for them. They should be generating more revenue, not less. I, because absolutely. I would get an hour blue band, So Absolutely. And I hope, and the reason I raised the topic is because the last thing I want to hear is the franchisees coming and saying, well, you've made changes and now, you know, it's going to change our economics and I'm afraid we're going to have to come back to you for more money. I do not want to hear that from any of them. I hope they're listening. Uh, because the truth is, yeah, maybe they'll have more in the black bins now. Maybe there will be a greater load that they'll have to dispose of. But they will have significant advantages in uh, being able to recapture costs from their recyclables in the blue bins. And um, so glad to hear it. We'll revisit that later when it comes. Um, see if I have anything else. I think... Um, I don't think I really have any other questions given the um, thoroughness of the of the chair's questions. Um, I do just want to say one last thing, and that is in response to both the chair's comments about industry and some of the folks who called in uh, concerned about the restaurant industry and grocery industry and others having an opportunity to weigh in on implementation. I, I think you've heard from the chair uh, and you'll certainly hear from me, uh, a complete commitment to ensuring that um, all business stakeholders are fully engaged in the development of this policy and process, because we know that that's the only way a policy can work. Um, if, if we don't make it uh, so that it is economically uh, viable and sustainable for business, no matter what our lofty goals are, they will not work. And so, just as LA 100 included uh, uh, mem business interests and uh, generator interests and um, uh, investor interests uh, within the whole process in order to make sure that it worked um, in the same way, uh, we have to do that here. That's what we did with the plastic bag ban. Um, we worked closely with the grocers to make sure that it was something that worked. Um, and we'll certainly do that with these policies as well. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much uh, for, for bringing this today. And again, thank you to everyone at Sanitation uh, and to our respective staff members as well for being so so diligent on getting this to this point. Thank you, Mr. Krikorian. And what I'll do is I'll schedule a status update from all the departments on the mayor's 2025 diversion goals in uh, an upcoming meeting in early 22. Thank you. Right, uh, any other 
colleagues on the queue, it looks like there aren't. So with that, what I'd like to do is instruct LA SAN in coordination with GSD, Recreation and Parks, City Attorney, and all other relevant departments to report on the steps necessary, including an effective implementation transition approach to phase out the purchase and use of single use plastics with a specific focus on the policy option, zero waste for city facilities and city sponsored events and analyze the identified policy recommendations referenced in table two under CEQA as appropriate. Also instruct the LA SAN to gather constructive feedback from a wide array of small and minority owned business stakeholders that may be impacted by the proposed policies and or ordinances. Um, I would like this back before Earth Day, which is in April, April 22nd, uh, just a few short months away. We have a sense of urgency about all of this. Uh, number two, instruct GSD, DWP, and uh, our Recreation and Parks to report on deployment of drinking fountains, portable hydration stations, and the needed funding to deploy them throughout all city facilities. Instruct uh, LA SAN to identify project or projects associated with the comprehensive strategies to reduce plastic waste in Los Angeles, focused primarily, not exclusively, on the potential city policies identified in table three of the report to analyze the identified project or projects under CEQA as appropriate and report to this committee biannually on LA SAN's progress on the foregoing. And four, instruct the CLA to draft a resolution or resolutions in support of the policy recommendations identified in table four of the report as it relates to potential policy changes at the state level. And five, in LA SAN to include in the mayor's proposed budget for fiscal year 22-23, the staff positions needed to effectuate these policy goals. And if there are no objections or additions, that shall be the order. Uh, Mr. Villanueva, could you please call the roll? Certainly, sir. Council Member Mitchell Farrell. Aye. Council Member Paul Coretz. Aye. Council Member Gil Cedillo. Aye. Council Member Kevin De Leon. Aye. Council Member Paul Krikorian. Enthusiastically, aye. The item is approved with those additional instructions, sir. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's bring back the milk bottles and the drinking fountains and paper cups and plastic straws. We did it before, we can do it again. Thank you, Sanitation, for your incredible report and your incredible work on, on this very important report. Uh, and with that, I'd like to now go to item seven. Mr. Blaine Sutton-Wills, would you please read the item? Item number seven, the Bureau of Sanitation report relative to developing voluntary service-based protocols for comprehensive cleaning and rapid engagement, the CARE Plus operations citywide and related matters. All right, and we still have sanitation with us to go over this uh, presentation. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee. Gabe Miranda, uh, Division Manager with Livability Services Division, LA Sanitation and Environment. I'm also joined by our CFO, Lisa Mallory, and our Assistant Division Manager, Domingo Orozco. Uh, so I'd like to provide a little context on the report we submitted um, Livability Services Division has worked really closely with personnel to hire and onboard over 40 vacancies to date in the division, uh, but we still have more ground to cover. While this has allowed for an equitable deployment of Care Plus teams dedicated to each of the 15 council districts, the ABH service zones, as well as the focus service zones, each of the Care Plus teams are operating at a reduced capacity. The phased hiring plan involves onboarding the two Care Plus teams in the budget and the seven care plus teams in the appropriated balance to fully staff each of the 22 care plus teams. The biggest challenge to date is new facility space for the additional personnel, including space for equipment and field offices for staff. 
We have been working closely with the mayor's office and the CAO to identify potential and new facilities to support the expansion of the division. Uh, for example, a parking lot in CD8 has been approved at MFC as a new deployment location for the division. But we are you know, looking to occupy that down the road once it's fully operational. So due to the current challenges of facility space, the plan involves avoid any delaying of the hiring of the two care plus teams. The division will hire and deploy them at an altered work shift of 3 o'clock p.m. to 11.30 p.m. As of present, all of our LSD facilities are, are currently at maximum capacity. Uh, Lopez Canyon is a location that is under construction, but currently, again, not operational. So rather than delay the hiring, uh, be able to utilize these resources during off hours and do a lot of critical work such as illegal dumping, emergency response, and also complete any special requests that come from the council offices. This will allow LA SAN to provide additional staff support to ongoing field operations while not incurring additional overtime costs, as well as additional costs for rental equipment, because the folks that will be coming in during those hours would utilize the same equipment that staff use during the daytime shift hours. Once additional developing facilities are open, the late shift staff will transition to the regular daytime schedule. Uh, otherwise, if this model proves successful, then this is something that we would obviously come back to council and maybe keep that as a more permanent basis. LA San is requesting that the remaining teams still in the UB be moved and authorized so that we can continue the momentum of hiring. Of the positions that are difficult to hire, takes time, um, we want to make sure that we continue that process. Pending new facilities, the seven care plus teams will also operate during the altered work shift of 3 p.m. to 11.30 p.m. Also, a request for one solid resource superintendent is being requested to provide management oversight uh, during that altered work schedule. Ensuring management coverage during these hours is critical to oversee and maintain all citywide operations taking place between those hours. Additionally, one sanitation wastewater manager one is being requested to provide adequate management oversight over our expanding mobile hygiene unit, which is providing much necessary bathroom and shower services to the unhoused as well as the enhanced pressure washing operations that are occurring as part of the enhanced services. The sanitation wastewater manager one is critical to oversee all aspects of wastewater operations within the livability services division. And moving on over to the admin support that we're requesting. Um, there are four care teams uh, budgeted for a bridge home servicing. Uh, currently though, we do have dedicated care and care plus ABH teams, which are providing routine scheduled services. Due to the urgent need of additional facilities to support the new personnel, LA San is prioritizing the hiring of the seven care plus teams on an altered work schedule. And that is the priority right now. And if we get that approved uh, and go forward with the hiring, we will be at capacity both during the daytime hours and the evening shift if we move the seven care plus teams to that work schedule. Although there is a need for additional care AB servicing based on the hiring plan just mentioned, um, and in order to facilitate the coordinated expanded resources, Alex San recommends approving and making use of staffing and funding made available for the four care teams for much needed administrative support. There exists sufficient funding and staffing for the 14 positions that we are requesting. Uh, and to put that in perspective, currently LSD is budgeted at just over 320 positions. We're a fast growing division. Um, and we do appreciate council and all of the approvals on boots on the ground and having quite a bit of field staff that we've been allocated over the course of the past few years. If the additional seven care plus teams are approved, we would be at about 400 employees in the division. And what that looks like on the administrative side is only 15 positions are allocated for administrative support. That's only 3.7% of the division. Uh, and it's really important to have administrative support to support these large field operations. Some of the daily tasks that they are responsible for is multi-step scheduling processing, including posting notices and confirmation notices for all 15 council districts, working with the Unified Homelessness Response Center and other city partners. This is upwards of 150 CARE Plus locations and 225 CARE locations that are scheduled every week that we need administrative support to make sure that these locations are scheduled and there's no hiccups within the schedule. Additionally, creating authorization, fulfilling data requests for projects, CPRA response and documentation, SR review and closure, timesheet calendar and documentation, incident and accident reports that take place at the district level, as far as processing FMLA paperwork, injury reports, training schedules, uh, hiring process, 
as well as purchasing, disbursement, and invoice reconciliation. These are all tasks that take place on a daily basis in which we do not have the adequate support on the administrative side. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Domingo to also reference the new RFP in which the additional support would also uh, uh, be recognized for that. Thank you, Gabe, and good morning, Mr. Chair, Council members. Uh, additionally, Ali San has been working with the CAO related to the development of the Sanitation Service Providers RFP. This uh, admin support staff will be essential to ensuring that that new program has the proper oversight and support to roll out smoothly. The staff will support administrative functions related to the program, including but not limited to oversight, planning, scheduling, resource and equipment, invoice processing, payment tracking, contractual compliance, legal compliance. And without this staff, the program will not have the necessary uh, support in place to be successful. These tasks will be in addition to the administrative items that uh, Gabe has mentioned. And, and as we discussed earlier, this is all part of the details that do matter as it relates to a lot of the education and outreach and service providing and legal compliance that'll be a part of this new program. Uh, with that, I turn it back to Gabe. Thank you. Uh, this is Barbara. Um, I wasn't scheduled to speak, but I think it's important to, to highlight um, that in my meetings with all of you, one of the, 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 it was always, it was very clear to me that you guys were very gracious with the work that's being down, down on the street, but the challenges that we're facing on a daily basis with, you know, making sure that the communication is happening and that the administrative process, that infrastructure was never put in place. You know, this division was, didn't exist a couple years ago. Now it's a, it's the, it, with this approval, it will be the largest division at sanitation. So I'm just asking, you know, if in order to improve the efficiencies on the street, we need this, this additional support. And I think that also, I think the second shift is going to address a lot of, you know, they start work before a lot of people wake up. So it will, and a lot of times I've heard from many, you know, residents and, and council offices, why are, you know, why did they leave the job halfway through? This will allow us to actually have more coverage in the evenings and addressing some of those emergencies, but also on an ongoing basis, we'll have, you know, we'll be able to capture what was done. We'll have a little more flexibility to address those jobs that take longer than we anticipated. So um, I'm really excited about uh, exploring this approach and uh, happy to answer any questions before I have to step away, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gabrielle and Domingo, and, and of course, Barbara. I can attest to what it takes to execute a Care Plus operation. I've been there. I've been there with the workers, and I can understand why it's going to become the largest shop in, in the Bureau of Sanitation uh, because of the magnitude of the work that's necessary to, to, for this to be a successful endeavor. Uh, so you can count on me as as a, a big support supporter of this. We ask more and more of sanitation, so we need to provide the resources. And I, I want to thank sanitation for being um, much more efficient after the reintroduction of, of Care Plus earlier this year uh, in, in my district. And so with that, some questions. When, when work is performed at a priority service location, How's the documentation going? Do you have, you feel good about the documentation, uh, checking it off as complete, uh, et cetera, with working within the current capacity that you have? Right, so, and thank you for that question. So the field documentation, which is primarily done by our environmental compliance inspectors who do the health hazards assessments, chain of custody, property storage, uh, that is ongoing. We are looking at ways to make that more efficient uh, and automated. Uh, utilizing tablets in which data entry can take place in the field and we can have more real real time data. Uh, and that's still a work in process. And uh, I think, you know, as we continue to grow in this division and find efficiencies, that's definitely one of them. We want to have more real time data that's available, readily available, and use that data and be able to share it with not just a unified homeless response center, but also the council districts um, as a means of communication. Right. And space is an issue. So what type of facilities are you currently using for staff and equipment 
in order to be nimble, we've got a big spread out city. So, so how are you dealing with that issue? Right, and that's that's been one of the challenges. So we've been looking at our current infrastructure within sanitation. We're actually working and developing two locations, both Lopez Canyon, as well as Toyon Canyon. So with the approval of the 29 positions for the regional storage expansion, that's a location that's under development now. Um, the shift and the focus now is on making sure we have enough facility space for the expansion of the staffing for the Care Plus teams. Um, and that, to Barbara's point with the altered shift, is a way that we can be operational now pending new facilities. But any facility for us is an open lot that has ingress, egress access for some of the larger pieces of equipment that we have. Uh, we do house quite a bit of equipment there. And then an office space for the administrative staff to support a lot of the driver's daily logs and the data inputting for that regional uh, facility. So in your district, Councilmember O'Farrell, Casador facility is a location that services your district. So something similar to that. Got it. Yeah, I've been there at 5 a.m. and it's quite, quite something to see. Uh, the report seeks to use staffing and funding for care teams for the needed administrative support. Uh, in relation to ABH, uh, Bridge Home Sites, once all positions are filled, will these sites get at minimum weekly attention? Yeah, and a little historical context on the bridge home. So in the previous deployment model, the care teams that were dedicated to each council district was responsible for servicing around a bridge home. Uh, what we did in the redesign was be able to dedicate uh, resources specific for a bridge home. So we have four care plus teams and four care teams that are dedicated to only bridge home servicing. So every bridge home zone gets one day a week of comprehensive cleaning and two days a week of care servicing. So it's basically three days a week of servicing for every bridge home currently under this deployment model. And that's that's happening right now? That's happening currently, yes. Okay. And, and it just underscores the uphill sort of effort here because uh, if you look at, at Hollywood, you, you see the challenge at Schrader uh, and we have to get that under control. I mean, the deal with the public was that we bring in uh, these very critical and needed a bridge home sites, but it comes with expectations. Uh, and so uh, it's, it, it's critical that they, they do get this weekly uh, attention as we uh, stand up more housing solutions. All right, thank you. Uh, colleagues, uh, let's see. I have no one on the queue right now. So what we'll do is uh, we'll move to approve this item. Oh, Mr. Kretz raised his hand the last second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Cedillo. Mr. Kretz has a question. <laughs> second. <laughs> and Paul, you're on mute. Second. <laughs> Thank you. You heard that. Paul, there's, there's urgency on the floor. There's a yes, uh, I, I assume everyone's had the same problems we have with doing cleanups two or three weeks in advance. Uh, we find it's, it's uh, uh, difficult sometimes when we have to wait to weeks if we miss a location, if we get a new location. Um, Sometimes we have to, to let people know it's urgent and to the, to the department's credit, they try to move things around. But we've, we've noticed a lot of challenges with the cleanings all being scheduled two to three weeks in advance. And uh, I remember a few months ago, we just had to get dates listed the Thursday before a Monday cleanup, which offered a lot more flexibility. Is there any way to, uh, change this, this two to three weeks policy um, and add some flexibility. Thank you, council member. And I think this is something that, um, you know, we definitely, as we start to build up and start to backfill a lot of these teams uh, with the expanded staff that we're seeking here today, I think that's something in the future we can revisit. One of the challenges we have now is balancing a lot of moving pieces uh, in scheduling a lot of these uh, encampments uh, for cleanups and servicing but a lot of that is done on the back end as far as outreach engagement working with our partners at the unified homeless response center working with our partners and service coordinators making sure outreach engagement all happens on the back end so that we make sure that that part of it also takes place prior to any priority servicing 
In addition to posted comprehensive cleanups, we still have three days a week dedicated to each council office for spot cleaning emergency response services. That doesn't require the same time frame, and that allows us to address any emergencies as they pop up. And then if we need to uh, add any additional services, we still make allowances for outliers as that arises. So we try to build in as much flexibility and as much nimbleness as possible, knowing that we're serving a large community uh, across the city. And I know you're short staffed. Is there, uh, have you have you looked at what some other departments have done with just doing job fairs and same day hiring? And uh, is there a way that that might help you to uh, hire more quickly through the personnel system? Thank you, Council Member. I think we would look at uh, a variety of different options and I would defer to our CFO if there's any additional information there. Thank you, Domingo. Yeah, there's there's multiple um, things that are creating this. Part is making sure we don't hire people unless we've got a place to space them. For our refuse collection truck operators, we had been waiting on the list, um, which is available now, and we're doing uh, hiring approximately 80 people off that list, both for this operation as well as our curbside collection. Um, so that was a, a major milestone for us. Um, we continue to work with uh, personnel departments um, to to look at ways to make sure that we are always going to have lists available and we don't fall into this gap where there where there aren't any, um, such as doing continuing hiring process um, and and things of that nature. So we're we're definitely taking the data we've gathered from our hiring um, and particularly um, the the excellent. Um, partnership that that we've had over the past several months that have allowed us to do hiring um, faster than um, I typically see it happen. So that's provided great data for us um, and we'll continue to work with personnel to optimize it and uh, and have them work with us on on new uh, ways to be able to to bring staff in more quickly. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. De Leon might have had to have left, but he had his hand up, but he had to leave by noon. So I, I think that maybe he's had to exit. Um, all right. So with that, uh, I'd like to move to approve the item. And it was seconded by Mr. Cedillo. Would you like me to uh, call the roll? Yes. Oh, please call the roll. Yes, yes. Council Member Mitchell Farrell. Aye. Council Member Paul Koretz. Aye. Council Member Gil Cedillo. Cedillo, aye. Council Member Kevin De Leon. Council Member Paul Krikorian. Aye. The item is approved, sir. Thank you. And that brings us to item six. Uh, please read the item, Mr. Sutton Wills. Item number six is a Board of Public Works report relative to the status of climate emergency outreach and community engagement for fiscal years 2020, 2020 to 2021 and 2021 to 2022, pursuant to the adopted budget recommendation. Thank you, thank you. I, uh, I know we have Board of Public Works President Greg Good here, as well as Director of Climate Emergency Mobilization Office, Marta Segura. So uh, whichever of you individuals would like to start, let's, uh, let's give the presentation. Thank you, uh, Chairman O'Farrell, and uh, good morning, everybody, or uh, actually good afternoon as of this moment. Um, <laughs> it's great to be with you all today, um, as always. Um, over the course of the past year, um, after years of work um, from the community, particularly LEAP LA and their coalition, this committee, um, the council uh, and the mayor, um, an unprecedented commitment was made uh, to not only address, mitigate, and build resilience to climate change, but as importantly, to do so through the lens and the actual involvement of frontline and indigenous communities, those most often and most disproportionately impacted um, by climate change. So with the leadership of the mayor, with Council President Martinez, and particularly Chairman O'Farrell, um, and the man uh, I'd like to, I often refer to as the godfather of CMO. Uh, Paul Koretz, uh, the Department of Public Works um, was tasked with establishing uh, a climate emergency mobilization office 
uh, to formalize the voices of frontline and indigenous communities in the development uh, of the city's climate mitigation and resilience policies. Toward those ends, council and the mayor put $500,000 in the unappropriated balance um, and asked for a report on how we'll make that happen. Uh, and consistent with that, there's a report in front of you um, and our esteemed director of the Climate Emergency Mobilization Office, Mark Segura, um, is prepared to provide a presentation outlining that plan. So thanks for having us. Marta, take it away. Thank you. And Marta, before you begin, uh, oh. Eric, I think you're not on mute. Oh, now you are. Okay. Please go ahead. Yeah. Great. Thank you all, um, um, Honorable Chair, Honorable Council Members, and ECADOR Committee for having us here today. Um, it's a pleasure to be here to respond to the Council Action Council File 210600S69. Um, which basically was a request uh, for a status update on our community engagement and outreach efforts uh, for CMO. Next. Oh, great. Um, and I particularly wanted to thank um, Chair O'Farrell this morning uh, because he has asked all. So before I begin, I'd like to point to some policies that we're working on um, that aren't uh, specifically relevant to outreach and engagement, but are necessary before we begin our outreach and engagement. Next. Um, and one of those policies obviously is um, 210450, which is a mechanism by which CMO, LA SAN, ITA, LADWP, and many other agencies will collaborate and create a cabinet to improve the efficiency of our GHG uh, emissions reporting. Um, we want to uh, set the goal of having a data portal and a dashboard. The, the progress that we've done have, this, have done thus far is meeting with many departments, including LADWP, ITA, and LASAN, to see how we can advise on a scope of work to ensure that we have the right platform to, to create a hub that will more transparently and more efficiently give the data um, that will report on the progress of our uh, green economy and green transition. Next. Um, and one more, one more slide before we begin on the outreach and engagement efforts. Um, as is obvious, uh, CMO is a startup. The Climate Emergency Mobilization Office is a startup within the city of Los Angeles. So I wanted to share these bubbles in this graph with you because we started in February forming. Um, we are right now at the norming stage. Um, and I believe we're beginning to perform because we're beginning um, uh, our, we have begun um, to collaborate with many CBOs, nonprofit organizations, frontline communities, uh, worker based organizations, and tenant rights organizations in order to create our climate equity assemblies, which will be one of the main engagement arms to ensure that communities not only learn about the climate policies that the city is creating, but also give us their input on how to advise our future commission, the Climate Emergency Mobilization Commission, and also how to advise council on the shaping of those policies. But I did want to point out that because we're, we're basically a historical office in development, we need to get through these stages before we transform the way in which we we address climate policy through the blueprint of more engaged and inclusive um, community input. Next. Okay, so now I'd like to <laughs> basically talk about the Climate Emergency Mobilization Office and what we're committed to and dedicated to. I think President Good did a fabulous job in describing what our goals are. So what I want to point out here is that CMO actually leads the design and vision for this community engagement process with the support of the Liberty Hill Foundation in order to create what we're going to be calling the Climate Equity LA Assemblies and Workshops. So these are gonna be virtual workshops that will, pre will be promoted citywide in all council districts through neighborhood councils, through these CBOs and coalitions and organizations that we're collaborating with. And this is the building block of an innovative governance model that CMO um, was asked to create as part of the vision and ordinance. Next. Um, 
And what's before you today is a council action to um, move the five hundred thousand uh, dollars from an unappropriated balance for fiscal year 21 22 to specifically be used for the climate emergency mobilization office so there is no general impact on the fund since it's already been allocated for this purpose and this what you have before you is the expenditure plan so a large chunk of it is for regranting to community-based organizations because this is the model that was created um, when LA County created its sustainability plan and the Liberty Hill Foundation was an integral part of that model to create the LA County sustainability plan. Uh, it's been promoted throughout the state actually that in order to get equitable um, participation of CBOs and their, and their constituents, that uh, level of compensation has to be provided so they can work on the design facilitation and really be an integral part of the process. So that is what we've done with part of this budget. And we also expect to be invoiced once this funding is transferred on a quarterly basis um, with a notice to proceed basis uh, from the Liberty Hill Foundation. Next. Um, and this is an example of some of the organizations that we're working with, but obviously there are many others, uh, but some of these uh, actually helped to establish the Climate Emergency Mobilization Office. And so therefore this is a very, CMO has a very unique partnership with these kinds of organizations that social equity organizations, so worker-based organizations, tenant organizations. Um, and it is because of this partnership that we um, have been entrusted to create this process by which we get their input for shaping, for advising on the shaping of policy, climate policy for the city of Los Angeles. Next. And I know there's a lot of colors here, but basically what we're trying to say is that we will host three to four um, climate equity assemblies that each and each will have a series of two to three workshops in collaboration with these CBOs who will help form curriculum design teams with UCLA and USC. And once we have our first series, and let's say our first series is building decarbonization, which we're scheduling for, for February, then out of that series of three sessions will come a policy paper, an advisory policy paper that will then be headed to our Climate Emergency Mobilization Commission. The commission will, will deliberate, and once they approve, then they will send it, at, send it to the council and to the committee for their review as an advisory paper to help inform council and help inform the committee on what their priorities are for that building decarbonization policy. And then we will also be addressing climate resilience. We will be addressing LA 100. And then there, of course, we're integrating just transition and equitable workforce development within each one of those categories. And then every year on an annual basis, we will have an additional set of policy priorities as per our polling of the community and as per our polling of internal policies that the city is interested in creating so that we can be in sync and providing um, necessary informative uh, feedback from the community in a timely fashion. Next. So to summarize, um, these are our metrics that we hope to accomplish, successfully host all of the climate equity LA assemblies of which there will be actually 10. And then each one will create a policy report. Um, we also hope to establish the, the Climate Emergency Mobilization Commission by the end of this year. Uh, we also hope that that Climate Emergency Mobilization Commission before the end of the next fiscal year will we'll create an equitable climate action roadmap, which is our strategic plan. And we want to be here to catalyze equitable climate policies that are a priority for the city and are a priority for the community and align it with LA's Green New Deal and, and align it with our strategic plan. And then the rest, I think I've already mentioned, we're, we're going to have various workshops and assemblies, engage hundreds of participants throughout the city of LA, um, have additional workshops that are more specialized and focused on issues that are not covered in those assemblies. 
and then have um, have all of this create an overall blueprint, a historical blueprint that I don't think exists anywhere else in the nation where uh, a climate emergency mobilization office has a commission and a really consultative, integral, um, community-driven process to help advise the commission and the council to shape equitable climate policy. Thank you so much. Um, and I think that concludes my presentation and I'm here for any questions and answers you may have. Thank, thank you. you. Mr. Gurren. Thank you, Mr. Good. Um, uh, thanks for the presentation. Terrific. And I just have a few quick questions and we'll just open it up. Um, okay. Uh, does the, uh, the the agreement, the scope of work with Liberty Hill, does it uh, contain, has you, have you fleshed out a schedule of the proposed action items with Liberty Hill yet uh, and any specified tasks? Yeah, the, there's a scope of work within the contract and, and the scope of work is being used in the notice to proceed process. So we, we have been... Um, We've actually already been working with them. They've been gracious enough to work with us, even though the, this, this funding hasn't been available. So we have been working in a very coordinated fashion to ensure that that scope of work is being implemented. And I can provide you with a, with a very, you know, with, with the scope of work itself. If you'd okay, like. that'd be great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then uh, one service proposed or offered by Liberty Hill is uh, community-led planning and engagement. Uh, stipends slash funds, and do we know what that entails? Yes. Um, so for the 10 workshops in the community assemblies, they will be participating in the curriculum design team or the workshop design team. They will also be uh, doing outreach and recruitment for those workshops for us. They will also help facilitate and note take within the sessions. And then they will also help disseminate and distribute the information that they learn um, and they obtain at those workshops and sessions with their constituents. Um, and we've already begun to meet. Uh, we've, had, we've had two meetings thus far and Liberty Hill is actually responsible for managing the MOU with these CBOs. So they, they're treating it like an official grant. So they're the fiscal agent and they have a fiduciary process that's very trusted. So any um, documentation that's needed by our finance department will be available to them from the Liberty Hill Foundation. Thank you. And uh, does the Godfather have anything to ask or say? Thank you. Um, I, I'm so excited to hear this item today, Mr. Chair, uh, and so glad that things are moving along so well. Uh, I want to thank Greg Good and Fernando Campos and the mayor and his team, and uh, also Council Member Krikorian for uh, his assistance through the budget process. Uh, Marta's doing a terrific job working with the Liberty Hill Foundation and building exactly the kind of community engagement process that we and the LEAP LA Coalition uh, initially envisioned. I'm also uh, really appreciative of the detailed report of the deliverables so far. And I can't tell you how excited I am to uh, see this come to fruition. It, it literally brings a, a tear to my eye. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I thank you all for that. I, I have a couple of questions though. In the council's 21-22 budget, we approve four positions for you for this year. Mm -hmm. And in terms of executing the goals of the office and building the office uh, capability, where exactly the CMO in the hiring process? Because the report isn't entirely clear about that. Great. Well, I'm happy to report that we have hired our engagement management um, analyst position. Uh, her name is Rebecca Guerra, and she's been phenomenal. She's only been with us a few weeks, but she has already done some really extraordinary work with us. Um, the other two positions, the admin clerk and the, uh, the second management analyst that will be uh, overseeing our policies and our council file uh, management, uh, et cetera, that, those two positions, the forms are completed and they're with the personnel department. And I'm waiting to hear back from the personnel department. In fact, um, uh, I guess it was early November, they informed me that they could 
put out the announcements. Uh, so we're there. We're, we're, we're at the cusp of, of personnel making those announcements, but um, I'm, I'm really anxious to, to get those out so I can begin interviewing and hiring those positions, and, and that would be a, a great help to continue um, making progress on our goals and accomplishments. Well, I'd like to see it happen sooner rather than later, of course. So perhaps sure. as personnel chair, I can be uh, modestly helpful <laughs> about. So maybe if you and, uh, and Commissioner Good uh, could reach out to my office, we could help move this along. Thank you. We, we, Thank are, you we are fired up to get the hiring done, Council Member. And, uh, and so trust that we will be reaching out for sure. Sounds great. And I know the funds we're releasing will go to contract work with the Liberty Hill Foundation. Uh, can you explain to us why Liberty Hill is so uniquely positioned to support this work? Sure. Well, the Liberty Hill Foundation is uh, a trust broker with social justice, social equity, and frontline community. Um, uh, and they've been doing this work, I think, for over 30 years now. Um, but they created this unique model with LA County where they were the integral partner that engaged organizations like the ones engaged with our process throughout the county of Los Angeles. And it was a very successful process. So they created this model and we, we were advised by many within the city and outside of the city that that was a model that we would like to adapt and customize um, uniquely for the city of Los Angeles. So they were uniquely positioned, and that's why we, we partnered with them. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Well, this is so exciting. So thank you, Marta, for getting this to this point. Thank you, everybody, and look forward to continued progress. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate this. Thank you, Mr. Koretz, and thank you, colleagues. Uh, seeing as there are no other speakers, I would now like to move to approve this item and refer it as per the chair's request to the Budget and Finance Committee. And with that, Mr. Villanueva, if you could please call the roll. Certainly, sir. Councilmember Mitchell Farrell. Aye. Councilmember Paul Kuretz. Aye. Enthusiastically. Councilmember. So I. <laughs> Councilmember Kevin DeLeon. Councilmember Paul Krikorian. Aye. The item is approved, sir. Cedillo, I, you have Cedillo on the record, please. Yes. Council Member Gil Cedillo. Aye. <laughs> Aye. Right. Thank you. Unanimous vote. Thank you so much. Thanks again, Mr. Good and Ms. Segura. And uh, we'll move this item forward. And Thank you all. Yeah, you bet. And having said, Mr. Villanueva, do we have anything else before this committee? The desk is clear, Mr. Chair. All right. With that, thank you so much. This meeting is adjourned.